Can mushrooms save the world or are mushrooms going to take over the world? These are some of the burning questions being Googled en masse and we're gonna try and answer some of them right here on today's episode of The Mushroom Show. My name is Tony Shields, this is episode 26 and this is the one place where you need to be if you wanna stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. So if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel get out to more people and if you wanna see future episodes of the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. First, let's go over a couple Couple quick pieces of mushroom news. Starting off with this super cool story that says 4AG Robotics raises 17.5 million in financing for mushroom harvesting robots. At first I saw this and I thought, yikes, like everyone's worried about AI, but what happens when the mushrooms and the robots team up? That's when we're gonna be in real trouble. But seriously, this is pretty cool and it actually addresses a real need in the mushroom industry, which is finding more efficient ways to harvest mushrooms. This is something that is a especially hard to do profitably. And one of the things that large scale mushroom producers deal with is finding labor because mushroom picking is pretty difficult, right? You need to kind of lean over on all of these different beds, get in these kind of awkward positions to harvest these mushrooms, and you need to be able to do it really fast, but at the same time, you need to do it carefully because mushrooms are kind of delicate and you don't want to bruise them. And that's what this article announcing the funding really talks about, and it's reiterated on their site, a company from British Columbia, Canada, which has designed and is starting to implement this mushroom picking robot. It says right here, 4AG's technology is helping to grow mushrooms in a more efficient and sustainable manner, all while tackling the industry's ongoing labor challenges. We're excited for this market-driven solution to a global problem. And this really could change the game in terms of mushroom harvesting worldwide. I don't know if it's necessarily a problem like they say here, but if you could way more efficiently pick mushrooms, well, this could potentially be a really big thing. And I have seen mushroom picking robots or mushroom harvesting robots being talked about for quite a long time, but I haven't ever really seen it being implemented in industry. So this is actually pretty cool. And another thing I noticed while I was researching this, it's not actually pronounced 4AG robotics, it's pronounced forage robotics, as in forage mushrooms, which I also thought was pretty cool. So I went over to check out their YouTube channel where you can see this thing in action and it's pretty cool, right? It has this little arm that just kind of swings out and then looks like it kind of suctions to the cap of the mushroom and then just twists it right off the substrate and plunks it into another arm, probably puts it down into a basket somewhere. So it'll be pretty cool to see what this robot actually is able to do. Now, this is obviously a very specific use case for agaricus mushroom farms, which are grown on these long beds. So I don't know if they'll be able to design robots that can harvest oysters or shiitakes or some of these other mushrooms, which again, take a lot of manual labor to actually harvest. It's one of the reasons why mushroom farming is actually such a difficult thing to do at scale because it takes so much hands-on work to actually harvest those mushrooms. So I'm interested to see how this is gonna be implemented and how other robots might be implemented in the future. In another piece of mushroom news, I saw an article last week week about a Connecticut mushroom farm that was growing so-called magic mushrooms. They didn't specify exactly what species, but I assume it was Solospi cubensis. And apparently the value of the mushrooms at this farm was $8.5 million. Now this is a pretty stunning number and it left a lot of people on social media wondering how many mushrooms were they actually growing at this farm? So here's one of the articles about this uh, bust and it says air conditioners on a cold day. Neighbor speaks out after 8.5 5 million in illegal mushrooms seized in a raid. It does go over some of the pictures you can see here from this home operation. It looks like they have all these grain spawn bags or substrate bags that are kind of laid out. And it looks like kind of a, a typical Solospi cubensis grow operation. A lot more substrate bags here, as you can see. These ones look pretty colonized. So anyways, a lot of mushrooms going on at this place, but $8.5 million seems like a pretty insane amount of mushrooms. And even though it looks like a pretty sizable home operation, you would probably have to add up the bulk weight of the substrate and the grain spawn and absolutely everything and multiply it by some so-called street price to come up with $8.5 million worth of mushrooms. They're probably not talking about the actual value of just dried Solospi cubensis, which would be a gargantuan amount. It is all a little bit ridiculous. I know we talked about it last time on the show, what legalization might look like and when it could actually happen. And here's just another example of why it could be useful to have a legal framework for these 
these things sooner rather than later. It is always kind of weird to see the dichotomy of a major push on the research side of things, major breakthroughs in therapy, and yet at the same time there are raids on these clandestine operations. I guess that is just all part of the turbulence of this major change. On to our next segment. Now mushrooms in general are getting more and more popular every single day. Just look at this Google Trends data for instance. It shows the general mushroom search terms on Google over time and you can see it's just a nice trajectory up and to the right. And there are tons of things that people want to know about mushrooms. It seems like one of those things where the more you learn about them, the more it piques your curiosity and the more you realize that they're an integral part of everyday life, the more you want to know. I thought it would be fun to go over some of the most Googled questions about mushrooms. The will, the why, the who, the what, the where, the when, and see if I can help satisfy the insatiable urge for mushroom knowledge. I used Google, but also this thing called Answer the Public, which aggregates the most Googled terms. So let's dig in. Starting with the most obvious of questions, will mushrooms take over the world? I assume this question is probably being asked because of The Last of Us, which was an HBO series that talks about a fictitious strain of cordyceps that turns everyone into zombies. The truth is though, mushrooms probably will take over the world eventually. They can feed on decomposing matter and will likely be around much longer than humans in some form. They are also intelligent. So I know everyone thinks that AI is the next form of intelligence that's gonna dominate this planet, but maybe it just goes dinosaurs and then humans and then mushrooms. Next question, and kind of related, is will mushrooms kill my plants? Now, I absolutely love it when mushrooms show up in houseplants. It's always an awesome surprise. And the general answer is no, they won't cause any harm to your plants. They won't cause any harm in general. Now, the most common one you might see in houseplants is this cool little yellow one called Leucocoprinus burnbaumii. Now, it will sometimes grow in clusters. And the reasons why people are Googling it so much likely is because it kind of looks exotic, right? It kind of looks like it could be poisonous or could be psychoactive or something like that. Now, I don't know about the edibility of this one. It's definitely not considered an edible mushroom, but it's not gonna do you any harm by just sitting there. Of course, if you have kids or something, you wouldn't want them picking out of the soil and eating it because again, I don't know about the edibility, but in general, if this mushroom shows up in your plant, it's just a nice treat and you can look at it for a couple days before it goes away. Next question is, will mushrooms give you gas? Now, I don't think there's a general answer to this because maybe everyone is a little bit different. Mushrooms can be hard to digest for some people and that is because because they are made up of these tough chitinous walls. Our stomachs weren't really designed to break down the cell walls of mushrooms, which is why you always want to cook your edible mushrooms before you eat them. And it's also the reason why mushroom supplements need to be extracted in order to extract those beneficial compounds from the mushroom and make them more bioavailable. So if people are eating raw mushrooms or undercooked mushrooms, maybe they can be a little more gassy. Maybe some people are more sensitive to it. Everyone's digestion system is different, but I don't think mushrooms are well known for giving people gas, especially if they're cooked or extracted. Now, humans eat mushrooms, but what about dogs? Which is a whole group of questions where people are Googling, will mushrooms make my dog sick? Now, I have two dogs. One is named Nova and the other is named Otis. Nova's pretty picky and Otis will eat absolutely everything. And it's not like he's gonna go out and whip out his copy of Mushrooms Demystified to try and figure out if that mushroom is edible or not. He's just gonna eat it. And since there are poisonous mushrooms that grow out in the wild, those can be poisonous to dogs. So will mushrooms hurt my dog? It really depends on the kind of mushrooms. If dogs are eating poisonous mushrooms, like if a dog happened to eat a death cab, then yes, it could make a dog really sick. And some dogs have died from eating mushrooms. But interestingly, dogs can very happily eat functional mushrooms. And actually one of the most popular functional mushrooms for dogs is turkey tail. A lot of people will supplement their dog's diet with some version of turkey tail extract or turkey tail powder, and it can have a lot of functional benefits. So if you're wondering if dogs can eat mushrooms, it really depends on the mushroom and the situation. The next question is why mushrooms grow on grass? Now this is part of a group of questions that people are asking that includes uh, why are there mushrooms growing on my lawn? What is this big circle of mushrooms on my lawn? Why do mushrooms grow in circles? And there are countless different mushrooms that could grow on your lawn. Some of them are gourmet edibles like shaggy mane, which likes to grow nicely in well fertilized grass. And there's other mushrooms that are poisonous that can make you super sick like chlorophyllum molybdenum or called the vomiter. That's another mushroom that commonly grows on lawns. But one of the mushrooms that commonly forms rings on lawns or golf courses, also commonly referred to as the fairy ring, is a mushroom called Marasmius oreades, 
which is again the fairy ring mushroom. And the reason why they grow this way is because picture the mycelium growing underground. It's gonna grow outwardly in this circle. And then the mushroom fruits at the leading edge of the mycelium, which is why it forms a ring. But the actual organism, a lot of it is underground in a large circle. And it's not like the mushrooms just grow perfectly in a ring for any other reason other than the fact that they're fruiting at the leading edge of the mycelium. So even though they're called fairy rings, they really have nothing to do with fairies. Next up is why mushrooms are good for you. And oh man, this is a really big question. Even if we just start with the button mushrooms, which for a long time, a lot of people thought they were just kind of empty and void of any nutrition. They're actually packed with vitamins and minerals and can be super nutritious. Button mushrooms are packed with B vitamins, which are good for energy among other things in general, they're packed with riboflavin, they're packed with niacin, and they're also a leading source of selenium, which is an important antioxidant. Further, they contain copper and potassium, which is obviously important, and they also contain high amounts of vitamin D2 if they're exposed to sunlight. But that's not even considering the very small group of functional mushrooms, which is a whole nother realm of mushroom goodness. These are mushrooms like reishi and chaga, which contain high levels of triterpenes, which can have all sorts of functional benefits. And of course, mushrooms that contain high levels of fungal beta-glucans, specifically turkey tail. Mushrooms can be insanely good for you, which is why we're seeing such an explosion in functional mushroom products and why so many people are Googling this term. Next question was, who discovered that mushrooms are edible? And I thought this was pretty fun to think about because it's pretty wild that some mushrooms will literally kill you, some mushrooms are just nutritious. Yeah, like who figured that out? The truth is, this was probably just done by trial and error over a long period of time. Think about it. Food wasn't always abundant. You couldn't just go to the grocery store and buy whatever you wanted. You had to try foods in your environment. If you didn't, you would just die. So it was very much so worth the risk to try different foods. They may kill you for sure, but if you didn't eat, you would starve, which would also kill you. And the risk would have been way higher too back when, I don't know, I guess our ancestors were trying different mushrooms and trying different foods because of course, if you ate a super poisonous mushroom that had amatoxins, well, that could kill your liver and you would die. But even if you just ate like a slightly poisonous mushroom that gave you some digestive upset, maybe gave you diarrhea and and had you throwing up and made you sick for a couple days, well, that could be a really big potential issue and you might just die from that as well. Perhaps the first known instance of humans using mushrooms is Oatsy the Iceman, who I have talked about before, but he was basically an early human who was found in the Alps some years back. He was perfectly frozen in the ice and among his few possessions were actually two mushrooms, one of which was the birch polypore and it was assumed that he was using it to route out some worms. So he was one of the first guys to really use functional mushrooms thousands of years ago. Go. So if you had to pick one person that discovered mushrooms are edible, maybe it was that guy. The next question is which mushrooms have the most protein? Now this is probably being asked because of this idea of replacing meat in a diet with mushrooms. Are you able to get the same kind of benefits or the same kind of protein? And if we look at the food data from the US Department of Agriculture, for example, you can see something like just plain old button mushrooms or white button mushrooms have about three grams of protein per 100 grams of fresh mushrooms, which actually isn't that much and wouldn't be anywhere near something that you can consider a meat replacement, at least for the protein aspect of it. Now, interestingly, there have been studies done that show people have lost weight from following a mushroom diet in this manner. This study, for example, shows a lower caloric intake of about 100 calories per day, which over time really does add up. And apparently it also helped with with blood pressure. Now I'm sure there are a lot of other factors and a lot of other lifestyle factors that play into this weight loss from this study as well, but it is interesting to see that one simple act of replacing meat with mushrooms can have such a profound effect, although I don't think mushrooms are really a great source of protein. Along the same vein is which mushrooms have vitamin D? Now this is a really interesting question because the answer is yes, mushrooms can have high amounts of vitamin D, but there is a trick to getting it out of them. We did do a reel on this or a short on this that went a little bit viral, so I'll just play that right now. Mushrooms are the only non-animal source that contain one of the most critical nutrients for humans, but there is a trick to actually getting it out of them. I'm talking about vitamin D. First of all, you should know that if you use a vitamin D supplement, there is a good chance that it's made from sheep's wool. Otherwise, if you want it in your diet, it'll come from fatty fish, from egg yolks, and from beef liver. Plain old, boring old button mushrooms actually contain super high levels of vitamin D, but not off the shelf. They need to be treated with sunlight. Just like UV light helps our bodies create vitamin D when the sunlight hits our skin, the same thing happens with mushrooms. Mushrooms contain ergosterol, and when it's exposed to UV radiation, it is converted into vitamin D. And it's not just a little bit, it's a lot. 
Fresh mushrooms at the store might only have about one microgram per 100 grams of vitamin D, but if they are sliced and put out in the sun for 15 to 20 minutes, that amount is increased by 10 times to 10 micrograms per 100 grams, which is about the daily requirement in many countries. Keep in mind though, and this is super important, that the vitamin D in mushrooms is vitamin D2 and not vitamin D3. And some people will argue that vitamin D3 is more effective at raising the levels of vitamin D in the blood, which is why it's more commonly found as a supplement. The next question is which mushrooms are edible? Now, obviously this is a super broad question that's not that easy to answer. I guess you could say, sure, if you find mushrooms at the grocery store, then those ones are most likely gonna be edible. But if you look at the entire universe of mushrooms, unfortunately there is no hard and fast rule to say which mushrooms are edible and which ones aren't. A similar question is which mushrooms are poisonous? And again, there's no simple rule to kind of suss this out. I know some people will have these rules that like, I don't know, if a mushroom has a slimy cap, it's poisonous, or if a mushroom is red, it's poisonous. Fortunately, none of these rules of thumb are true, and the only way to know which mushrooms are edible and which mushrooms are poisonous is to really understand the mushrooms that actually grow in your area, become familiar with them, and that's really the only way to do it. Now, of course, there are some entire genuses that you want to avoid because they're more likely to have poisonous mushrooms, but in general, there's no hard and fast rule. You just gotta learn them all kind of one by one. The next question is, where are mushrooms grown? Now this is another awesome but huge question. And the truth is mushrooms are really grown everywhere. Almost anywhere in the world, people are growing all different types of mushrooms. But there are some areas that are a little more concentrated. In the US, for example, Pennsylvania is kind of the place to grow mushrooms. They're growing millions and millions of pounds of button mushrooms every single year. And there's a good chance if you have button mushrooms on your plate anywhere in the US, it comes from a very small area in Pennsylvania. Now these are huge operations and that's really what it takes to be able to grow button mushrooms profitably. Now, if you're thinking about uh, different types of mushrooms or what are called like exotic mushrooms in the industry, mushrooms like yellow oysters and blue oysters and maybe even shiitake, these are often grown on smaller farms throughout the US. But of course, there are lots of other places in the world where they're growing tons of mushrooms. In China, for example, they have been growing mushrooms for centuries. And that is where a huge portion of the world's mushrooms are grown today. The vast majority, actually. They're absolute experts in mushroom cultivation, but the mix is a little different with more farmers opting to grow mushrooms like shiitake and enoki instead of the white or brown button mushrooms that are more popular in the US. The next question is how mushrooms grow, which I guess is similar to the question how mushrooms are grown. But I'm thinking if people are typing how mushrooms grow, thinking more about like what the mushroom life cycle is, how they grow in the wild, and how mushrooms are grown is more so how are they cultivated. But the answer should be kind of the same really because all cultivators are doing is just trying to mimic what happens out in nature, mimic that natural mushroom life cycle so they can grow lots of mushrooms in a small space. And it also depends on the type of mushroom. Basically, mushroom mycelium can digest nutrients that eventually cause mushroom fruiting bodies to form, which drop spores, and the whole cycle starts over again. Again, this is the mushroom life cycle, and it's a beautiful thing. There are dung-loving mushrooms, which grow on compost, like button mushrooms, for example. And then there are wood-loving mushrooms, like oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms which grow on wood-based substrates. Then there are the mycorrhizal mushrooms like Amanita muscaria and porcini, which grow in coordination with other trees and plants. It is really complex and in general, we're still learning about it because not every mushroom can be grown and cultivated. Not every mushroom is one which we perfectly understand the mushroom life cycle. Take the morel mushroom, for example. I think there's still a lot of debate in terms of how those things actually grow. So it's a pretty interesting area to study. The next question that gets Googled a lot is how mushrooms can save the world. But unfortunately, this is not as it seems. I wish people were just Googling out of random curiosity how they can save the world with mushrooms, but it seems like this is likely in reference to a 2008 TED Talk by Paul Stamets. It honestly feels like it was yesterday, but yes, 2008 by the legendary Paul Stamets, where he goes over the six different ways that mushrooms are saving the world. He has been at it for a long time, that's for sure. Now, if you're watching this channel, you've probably already seen this TED Talk, but if you haven't, you should definitely go check it out because it's still really cool. The next question is how mushrooms communicate. Now, this is actually a way cooler and deeper question than you might think. We actually did a whole video on this 
this and it was based on some recent research where they found apparently mushrooms have a language, they have their own language of about 50 words. Now they're not actually talking to each other but instead sending electronic signals and using that to communicate. You may have seen those videos of people putting like little electrodes on mushrooms and using it to create music and that is essentially how they determined that mushrooms have a language. But even crazier is that mushrooms seem to be able to communicate to each other to do things like hoard resources so that they can charge more for them. Mushrooms really are intelligent and we are just starting to figure out how intelligent they actually are. Finally, we have the age old question, are mushrooms vegetables? Surprisingly, this still gets Googled a lot and the answer is no, they are not vegetables. Mushrooms are actually part of their own kingdom, right? The kingdom of fungi. And the reason why they're different from plants or different from vegetables is because they cannot photosynthesize. They don't take sunlight and use it to create energy. Instead, they use a mycelium to digest things like kind of having an inside out stomach and use that to create energy. This does trigger some mycophiles and mushroom lovers where they see things like uh, mushroom jerky that say fully plant-based or something. No mushrooms are not plants. No mushrooms are not vegetables. Mushrooms are a kingdom of their own. Okay, that's it. Obviously I didn't answer every single one of your burning questions about mushrooms. That's why ChatGPT exists. Actually no, ChatGPT still hallucinates quite a bit when it comes to mushroom questions. So if you do have other burning questions that you wanna know about mushrooms, let me know in the comments below. On to our next segment. Now I thought it'd be fun to dedicate a whole segment every once in a while to weird things that mushrooms do or weird mushrooms. For now, I'm just going to call it the weird mushroom segment. And in this episode, I want to highlight the lobster mushroom. Why? Well, if you've ever seen a lobster mushroom, you know that it's called this because it has kind of a red hard crust on the outside that kind of looks like a lobster. But what if I told you that it's actually two mushrooms disguised as one? The red lobster shell is actually another fungus known as Hypomyces lactose florum, which is a parasitic Ascomycete fungus that grows on other mushrooms. So basically it's a crust that finds other mushrooms and then takes them over and slowly but surely consumes their flesh, forming this neat, unique, entirely new mushroom that is considered a delicious gourmet edible, one of the best and most sought after. Now lobster mushrooms are commonly found in the wild and they can't be cultivated for obvious reasons, but you can sometimes find them in grocery stores. Here for example is one of them in Far West Farm fungi Santa Cruz store, just super cool to see. You might also find them in farmer's markets where people are bringing in wild mushrooms that they found, so definitely keep an eye out for them. But the crazy part is that it's not at all obvious which mushroom existed before the Hypomyces lactiflorum took over it. So what the original mushroom was before it became a lobster mushroom. One of the most common though is one called Rushula brevipes, which on its own is just kind of meh. Like nobody really goes out into the woods looking for Rushula brevipes. But once it's been parasitized by Hypomyces lactiflorum, it emerges as a whole new thing, this delicious gourmet edible known as a lobster mushroom. There was some research done in 2009 that actually explains how the DNA of the mushroom changes throughout the fruiting body as the infection progresses. Basically as the parasite starts on the outside but continues working its way through the mushroom. And although the interior of the mushroom does not change into this lobster color, the DNA changes as the parasite takes over, which substantially changes the metabolism metabolite profile of the original mushroom, making it delicious. But Hypomyces lactiflorum can also infect other species of mushrooms. One of the common ones is Lactarius species or milk caps and other types of Rushulas. Which leads to the inevitable question, what happens if Hypomyces lactiflorum, this parasitic Ascomycete fungus, infects a poisonous mushroom, turns that into a lobster mushroom, and people who are harvesting them can't tell the difference? Is it possible that there are are seriously poisonous lobster mushrooms out in the woods. Although sure, this is theoretically possible, there is no known case of this that I could find. Sure, there may be issues with misidentification or people thinking they have a lobster mushroom when it's actually something entirely different, but the chances of Hypomyces lactiflorum actually infecting another poisonous mushroom is probably pretty low, which is why people have been consuming this mushroom for a very long time with no issue. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear what you think of the show. So if you have any comments, be sure to let me know in the comment section below. And of course, if you like the show, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you wanna see future episodes of the show, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. It really helps us so much. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.